Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. On November 5th, 1971, a young Elton John released his fourth studio album, Madman Across the Water, and it didn't go great. He was still early in his career and hadn't really hit his stride yet. In fact, he was in a bit of a slump, and in a 1972 interview, he described the process of making Madman like this. In the end, it was cut because we had to do an album. It was very painful. It was done under pressure and really tortured out of us. The album's middling sales figures meant it only got two singles, the second of which wasn't even released in his native UK. In the US, that single only managed to reach number 41 on the Billboard Hot 100 before quickly falling off, and it wouldn't even be sort of gold for another 30 years. The whole thing seemed destined for obscurity, an underwhelming single off one of his worst performing albums, but that's not what happened. The single, which as you've probably guessed by now is Tiny Dancer, was a massive sleeper hit, slowly building in popularity over the years, and after an assist from the 2000 film Almost Famous, it finally blew up. Today it's one of his most iconic songs, and it even appears on Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Songs of All Time, so let's take it apart. The song starts like this. And... Crap, am I gonna have to talk about keys again already? Okay, so the most obvious thing to do would be to call this 1 and 4 in C major, and that's totally valid, but just for fun, I'd also like to look at what this would be in the key of A minor. I'll explain why in a bit, but for now, please just trust me, I have no idea what I'm doing. In that key, this is going back and forth between the flat 3 and the flat 6. Each of these chords is one note away from the 1 chord, so we're sort of dancing around our root without ever really landing there. This results in a softer, more restful loop, and I think that more accurately describes how this section sounds, at least to my ears. But why? Well, I think the best argument for this analysis comes from the bass. Now, to be fair, there is a low C at the very bottom of the piano voicing, but it's quiet and it doesn't move, so the thing I hear as the bass line is actually the note above it, which alternates between G and A. I'll turn it up so you can hear what I mean. This puts both chords in what's called an inversion, which just means the bass note, or in this case the apparent bass note, isn't the root of the chord. This weakens the chord's harmonic impact, obscuring its identity a little bit, so while this is still very much a C chord going to an F chord, it's also kind of a G chord going to an A chord. It's both, which softens the overall effect. 1-4 is a powerful, dramatic sound, which you can hear if I add in a strong root line. But without it, the actual impact feels more in line with the A minor analysis. That said, I want to come back to C major because I said it was valid and I meant it. I mean, obviously any analysis is valid if it matches what you're hearing, but my point is that the C major analysis matches what I'm hearing too. It feels right to me. If I had to pick one key for this song, I would definitely say it was in C major. As I've argued in previous videos though, the longer I work as a music theorist, the more convinced I become that the traditional concept of a key as this single rigid object where we can only have one at a time unless we're doing something something really weird is insufficient, especially when it comes to popular music. It's a compellingly simple way to think about tonality, but it just doesn't seem to accurately describe how I experience a lot of music, so I've tried to move away from it in my work. So yeah, this song is definitely in C major. In fact, as it goes, the C in the bass becomes more prominent, making that root even clearer, but the first few moments of a song play a huge role in shaping your sense of tonality, and these softer inversions leave the door open for A minor as well. This brings us to the verse, where it becomes a bit more obvious why I want to talk about A minor minor because the melody will not stop resolving to A. Blue jean baby, LA lady, seamstress for the band. Of the 12 lines in the verse, 10 of them end on A, with the others ending on C, ballerina, and G, tiny dancer in my hand. The two most stable points in C major, but they're both in metric positions that imply instability. Maybe it'd work if he at least stayed on C for the last line in the stanza, Seems just for the band. but as is, it's just not a C major melody. Or, I mean, I guess you could argue that it is, it's just leaning on the sixth for a sense of melancholy, but really, that's the same thing I'm saying. It's the same idea, just with slightly different words. Actually, let's take a closer look at that idea, because I think it's important. When we talk 
talk about songs existing in multiple keys, it's easy to assume that the ambiguity is the point. Having a single, clearly defined key center is the default, so any deviation must be there to represent some sort of uncertainty in the story, and that definitely happens, but I don't think it's what's happening with Tiny Dancer. The lyrics are a little abstract at times, but the story is crystal clear. It's a love song from a touring musician to a member of his entourage. In fact, it's probably specifically about Maxine Feibelman, who was literally the seamstress for Elton John's band, had a background in ballet, and was at the time romantically involved with lyricist Bernie Taupin. There's not much ambiguity there to highlight. No, my point isn't that we're drifting lost in the space between two keys, but that we're in a single, unified tonality that just happens to have elements of both. The overall effect is a sense of layering, with a major core wrapped in minor trappings. It sounds sweet and intimate, reflecting a love within that shields against the outer cold. Anyway, the verse consists of four three-line stanzas. The first two are over the same CF vamp as the intro. The only real change is that, for the third line, they slow down the harmonic rhythm, playing each chord for a full bar, to give a bit more weight to the final phrase and help fit the three-line lyrical structure into the more typical four-line metric pattern of most Western popular music. The third stanza, though, mixes it up, playing this... And then, if you'll give me a second to distract the copyright bots, this. These two progressions are pretty similar, so let's start with the second one because the structure's a bit clearer. If we just look at these first three chords, any student of Western harmony could tell you this was 4, 5, 1 in A minor. We're even using E7, which doesn't exist in C major, but gets used a lot in minor to make the resolution even stronger. It's a pretty unambiguous establishment of that key, or at least it would be if there wasn't this pesky G7 right afterwards pointing us back to C. This implies the E7 was actually what's called a secondary dominant, a chord borrowed from outside the key to give us a moment momentary resolution to some other chord before returning to our real root, but I don't think that's the best way to read this because of the first half. If we look at the first three chords again, we see the skeleton of the second progression within it. F major is the upper structure of D minor 7, that is, if we take our D minor 7 chord and remove the root, we get an F major triad, so the two share a similar character. After that, we have another E chord, but whereas last time it was dominant, here it's just minor, softening the directional strength and weakening the resolution to A. Taken as a whole, this feels like him dipping his toes into the water, doing a hollowed out version of that 4-5-1 before leaping in and committing to the real thing. He's playing the progression twice, and I'm sure we all know what repetition does by now, so with a whole section wrapped up in this excursion to A minor, it feels odd to me to just call it a secondary dominant and be done with it. The emphasis on A also helps explain this D major chord, which is a bit tricky to justify without it. Personally, I'd describe it as a kind of tonal overshoot, momentarily going all the way to A major to borrow its 4 chord before switching back. It's where he finally takes the plunge, switching from the timid minor version to the real resolution, and that out-of-key F-sharp, borrowed from the parallel major and emphasized in the bass with another inversion, pulls your ear toward the correct side of the tonality. The last stanza returns to the C F vamp, putting us back on familiar ground. At the very end, though, instead of sitting on F, it does this little turnaround... walking down the scale to return back to C at the start of the next verse. It's a nice effect, creating a sense of everything falling into place, which is fitting because this is also where the orchestration really comes together. The first verse was just Elton and his piano, but the second brings in pretty much the whole band, including Roger Pope's drums with a soft but emphatic 16th note groove, David Glover's bass playing constant driving Cs, and three different guitars. There's Davy Johnstone strumming an acoustic, Caleb Quay playing fills on an electric, and BJ Cole on a steel slide guitar for some extra chill vibes. Stacking all those different lines on top of each other creates a rich, complex texture that can be enjoyed as a single musical surface, but also invites you to explore all the different layers of sound. It's a phenomenal piece of sonic architecture that really sets the second verse apart from the first one. Going straight to it, though, would be a huge dynamic shift, so to help smooth it out, they foreshadow the build by bringing in Cole's slide guitar a section early, playing along with the last stanza of the first verse. This turns the whole thing from a sudden explosion of energy to a calmer, more manageable buildup. Without it, the transition would sound like this.
which is fine, but a little abrupt for the song. And they repeat this trick in the second verse using the same location to introduce the background vocals, which will play an important role in the chorus. But before we get there, we get interrupted by the pre-chorus. <laughs> And here we need to switch back to thinking in C for a bit, because much like we borrowed from A major in the verse, here we've shifted fully into C minor. That's the beauty of a flexible key, you get access to a lot of extra harmonic space around the margins. Interestingly though, while we've shifted to a truly minor tonality, the emphasis is still on the major chords. We start with flat 6 and flat 7, setting up a classic walk-up resolution back to 1. In fact, at this point we haven't actually heard a minor chord yet, so you might even be expecting a return to C major, creating that classic triumphant Mario cadence. Instead though, our walk-up gets interrupted by a trip to the minor 5 chord, echoing the E minor from the verse, and then we slink back to the minor 1. This expression of actual minor falls under the lines lying here with no one near, implying a lonely scene, but as he sings only you, we're back to the comfort of our major chords, first extending the A flat and B flat to a full bar each, before going back to G, but this time it's G major. <laughs> to bring us back to our warm, welcoming original tonality for the chorus. Over that G chord, the melody sits on an F. When I say softly, slowly. Which is fitting because despite the strongly implied resolution, the chorus doesn't actually start on C, it starts on an F chord. <laughs> It inverts the pattern from the verse, going 4-1 instead of 1-4, and it also changes the bass. Whereas in the verse we were playing C underneath both chords, in the chorus the F chord gets a bass note F, which then slides down to E for the C chord, putting it in an inversion and destabilizing it a bit so it doesn't feel like a completely resolved one chord. This progression starts each of the phrases in the chorus, and for the second half he alternates between two endings. The first is this. where the bass continues its walk down, settling on D minor. This has roughly the same function in both keys. Whether it's the 2 chord in C or the 4 in A, it's an unstable, directionless sound that leaves the door open for further motion. The second ending, though, is a bit more complicated. Here we have a G major triad being pounded out over an A bass pedal. Looking through some of the other instruments, it seems like the overall harmony is meant to be some kind of A chord, so we can view these extra notes as upper extensions, added tones that don't belong to the chord but sound good over it anyway. In total, that makes this A minor 11, which, yeah, that seems right, but I think it's interesting that this visit to the A root would have such a prominently accented statement of the C root's 5 chord. The frantic piano arpeggio really draws your attention away from the A based harmony onto these three specific notes, the three notes that tell you you're about to hear a C. It's the closest these two key centers come to really being in conflict with each other, and you can hear that disagreement in a way that hasn't really been present up to now, and won't really be present again. I don't really have a great narrative explanation for it, but it sounds awesome, and sometimes that's all you need. Melodically, the chorus becomes much more disjunct. Up to now, Elton's been singing in a fairly narrow range, moving exclusively by steps and thirds, but here we run up to a high C, well above anything else he's sung so far, before immediately dropping down an octave. Hold me close, tiny dancer. The lines alternate between ending on A over the D chord and D over the A chord, so the resolutions never quite line up. Using D as his unstable note is a good choice because again, it serves that role equally toward both roots and could happily resolve to either one. In the second half of the chorus, this melody is joined by background vocals, but interestingly, they only sing along with the lines that end on A. When Elton goes for the dissonant ending, he's left all alone. This may be in part to allow him to transition to the song after interlude after the chorus, where they alternate between a quieter version of that A minor 11 shape and an F chord before settling back into the verse. From there, we get another verse, pre-chorus, and chorus, and while there's not a whole lot new to say about them, they may provide some insight into why the song was initially such a flop. You see, when it first came out, listeners weren't actually all that likely to hear the album version. Instead, they would have mostly been exposed to the radio edit, and since the song takes so long to actually deliver the chorus, that version just cuts it off right after. The first four minutes are a long, slow build, and by chopping it off right after the climax, you wind up with a pretty boring contour. The triumphant arrival of the chorus after 
two and a half minutes of waiting is undercut when, instead of relaxing back into a verse and building up again, we just fade out on nothing. There's no interest curve. No wonder audiences were bored. And the thing is, there's really not that much new in the rest of the song. The biggest thing is that the last verse adds the string section that got introduced in the chorus, which, don't get me wrong, it sounds great, but ultimately it's just another layer in the already crowded orchestral landscape. It's not really breaking new ground, and most listeners wouldn't even have noticed, at least not consciously. But that's the thing, the song didn't need anything new, it just needed more time. By repeating the last few sections again, we got a richer, more developed dynamic contour that makes the song feel like a journey instead of a race. I think when you're writing songs, it's easy to convince yourself you have to keep adding, but eventually, that just gets cluttered. Sometimes all you really need is to look at what you've already got and say, hey, let's do more of that. And that's pretty much it, but before we go, I wanted to mention one last thing. While researching this, it came to my attention that David Bennett had also recently done a video on Tiny Dancer. I haven't actually watched it yet. I tend to view my analytical process as mostly a journaling exercise, exploring my own experience of a song I love in order to understand why it means what it means to me, so I try not to check out other people's thoughts until I've finished examining my own. That said, David's great, and I'm sure his video is great, so I'll put a link in the description if you want another perspective on this song. And hey, thanks for watching. As always, this video was chosen by my patrons on Patreon. The poll to pick the next one goes up over there next week. Oh, and don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.